Hello everyone, this is the uh, fourth in the 42 Bedford Row seminar or webinar series um, and today my name is Mark Chaloner uh, and I'm here with or uh, in a separate location in fact but with Amanda Jepson um, and we're going to present the public law update for 2023 um, and uh, we're both barristers at 42 Bedford Row who do an, an awful lot of public law proceedings um, and the broad proposal uh, is that I will go first, present roughly the first half of the presentation uh, and Amanda will present roughly the second half um, and in essence what we've done is we have looked at uh, various cases of interest that have come to our attention over the last 12 months or thereabouts uh, and we hope it will be of interest to you um, and so in that case I will start the presentation with the first slide um, and um, the first case to refer you to is REH parents with learning difficulties uh, 2023 um, this was an interesting case in that uh, it continues a trend in terms of learning disabilities and the court's approach towards parents with learning disabilities and the need for support. Um, in, that in this case, we had H, who was a child of 22 months by the time of the final hearing, uh, who had two parents, both with uh, each with individual learning disabilities. Um, H also had four siblings, um, and those siblings had their own difficulties. Um, in particular, and of importance in this case, was D, uh, an older sibling who had been alleged to have sexually inappropriately touched uh, a five-year-old child. Um, it had not, however, and this is of significance, ever been proven uh, that that had occurred. Um, it's right to say that also the local authority had become involved in relation to the other siblings, um, and uh, they also had been removed and made the subject of ICOs. Um, within this case, a significant issue, first of all, was the way in which threshold had been drafted um, and the way in which risk of harm was approached, in particular in relation to Dee, uh, who was the child who had been accused of, uh, in, uh, of allegedly uh, touching a child. Um, the position in relation to that was that the parents, in fact, through their lawyers, had made an admission uh, that plainly this may give rise, they said, to a risk of harm. Um, however, on appeal, what was said was that that was an inappropriate approach towards risk of harm on the basis that, in fact, there had never been a proven harm because it was nothing more than an unproven allegation. And rather than that, what we were actually dealing with was a possible risk of harm. And the courts uh, of appeal were actually very clear uh, that a possible risk of harm is not the same as a risk of harm. And it's insufficient to found a risk of harm. Uh, and so the Court of Appeal were quite critical in that regard and made very clear that risk of harm must still be founded upon uh, facts which had been proven within the proceedings or elsewhere and cannot, as I say, be general allegations. Uh, and perhaps that ties in somewhat uh, with the way in which there's been a tightening up of the expectations of threshold in RIA, etc. The second aspect, uh, the particularly uh, interesting aspect for those who uh, have parents or represent parents who have learning disabilities or for local authorities who need to take account of them, um, was the court's approach to parents with learning disabilities. In that case, there was a significant argument about substituted parenting and the extent to which the requirements of the parents uh, that would need to be put in place to allow them to care were realistic on an ongoing basis. And the court could not have been clearer um, that actually the local authority is under a duty under the CARE Act in particular to ensure that they are providing suitable services and in this case the Court of Appeal was uh, quite critical that actually sufficient thought had not been given to exactly what services could be provided and should be provided under the CARE Act and whether in fact therefore these parents were suitable for care um, and as I say it continues the long-standing trend now uh, of it making clear that the courts will not stand for a lack of support um, for parents with learning disabilities such that they're not enabled to care for their children. Um, and as I say, what it does raise is the interaction between the CARE Act, uh, which is largely to do obviously with the adults uh, and the support that needs to be provided to the adults and the Children Act and the extent to which CARE Act provision will allow them uh, to fulfil their duties towards children uh, in order that uh, Children Act orders are not required. Um, so that's an interesting case for those who represent parents with learning disabilities, or as I say, those who need to take account of it. Um, we then move on to a different topic, 
on the next slide, um, which is to do with anonymity of social workers. Um, again, here there are developments, although it's fair to say they're developments on an ongoing trend towards transparency. Um, obviously, more generally, it's not on the slide, um, but we have the transparency pilot uh, running in certain courts up and down the country. Some of you may have seen the recent Panorama documentary in particular coming out of Leeds as a result of the transparency pilot. And it's fair to say we can almost certainly expect further developments in terms of transparency to come over the coming months. And it was, of course, one of the president's three tasks that he set himself uh, for as long as he remains president. In terms of transparency, however, we have, first of all, Tickle and Herefordshire County Council. Um, the background, of course, was that Mr Justice Keane, whilst he had been, um, he's not anymore, but he was at one stage the Family Division Liaison Judge uh, for the Midlands, which included Herefordshire, and he gave uh, four judgments in particular in which he was roundly critical of Herefordshire and the approach they'd taken to families within those cases. Uh, they had come to the attention of Louise Tickle. Um, in addition, Ofsted, uh, had been uh, visiting Herefordshire and had found limited progress in 2021. Um, and we had a mother in Herefordshire who wished quite uh, clearly on her own case to tell her story as to what she had experienced at the hands, she said, of Herefordshire County Council. Um, she wished to tell her story. Uh, Louise Tickle, uh, the journalist, wished to publicise that story uh, and put that out there. And the question was the extent to which uh, she should be allowed to do so first of all and the width of any reporting restrictions order and the need to protect the children um, and also the anonymity or otherwise of the social workers involved. The uh, court considered the case and it's interesting for a, a number of reasons but first of all we had children who were eight, four and three uh, at the point of the hearing in the High Court um, and the court noted a trend uh, which has been developing uh, which is to say that, of course, it's not always going to be contrary to a child's interests for there to be publicity. It will not always be adverse uh, for cases to be publicised. Um, and whilst the children's interests will be a major factor, um, it is not the determining factor. There'll be a balancing of rights involved in the case. Um, and as I say, that's ongoing trend from a number of cases now, but it, it is clearly the starting point for the courts. Um, Moving on, however, in that case, the court ultimately conducted a balancing exercise and found that actually given these children were relatively young, it said, under eight, and they were likely to have therefore limited access to social media, given they said that in fact the reality of uh, these children's situations was that their local community already knew that children's services had been involved uh, because it wasn't a secret in the local community, actually there was an unlikely to be a significant adverse impact to them by way of publication um, and indeed the court also noted which is a factor that may need to take into account this wasn't a case involving for example physical abuse or sexual abuse uh, so there weren't intimate details of the family's lives which were likely to be told uh, in the mother telling her story um, and so on that basis the court did grant permission to the mother to tell her story uh, and to be named in an unanonymized un form um, the court then moved on to consider the identification of social workers. Herefordshire made very clear that in relation to one social worker, they were concerned about identifying the social worker leading to identification of children. Of course, that argument fell away uh, once there was agreement, once there was uh, the order or decision uh, to identify the family anyway. Um, but moving on, the other part of it was whether the social workers themselves should have protection. And the court was very clear uh, that there isn't a general presumption of protection of social workers' names. Herefordshire argued that there's a uh, dearth of social work recruitment, uh, that people don't want to come into the profession. It was only going to lead to further difficulties for the profession. Um, but the court was very clear that it wasn't prepared to accept that argument. And in that case, the social workers could and should be named. There was a public interest in so doing. Um, it did note the Abassi test, uh, which really wasn't a, a care case. That was a case relating uh, to medical treatment. Um, and in that case, the court had set out that it would be wrong to name medical professionals uh, in those medical treatment cases where there was harassment or vilification, as they put it, uh, of professionals. Um, however, the court was clear that in this case, there wasn't harassment or vilification such as to warrant non-identification of the social workers, um, so they should be named. 
Um, and that led on to, uh, or, or another case on a similar topic is B, R and G. Uh, in a similar vein, we had here a, a young child, uh, G, whose sibling unfortunately had died uh, and the parents uh, of G and G's sibling had been charged with murder. Um, and the criminal courts had initially uh, conducted or put in place a blanket uh, reporting restrictions order but then in, within the criminal arena it was decided that was too wide and there wasn't jurisdiction so it was referred over to the family court um, and ultimately the family court held there was not uh, it wasn't right or in principle either to anonymize in that case because there was a public interest in those names being known in the ordinary way um, and so again we have identification uh, and transparency uh, ruling the day and as I say that would appear to be an ongoing trend although we will need to wait and see. Um, moving on or to a different topic on the next slide um, we then have post-mortem delays and issues arising for post-mortem delays and um, this has uh, been uh, mentioned certainly in a previous talk by Tina Cook uh, the head of our chambers and hopefully some of you may have been able to watch that but uh, the position is that Reg is uh, curious in that the president is very clear he's giving a judgment even though he actually didn't make a decision uh, because it was resolved without having to make a decision um, but he felt that it did it, or was worthy of reporting um, and the issue that's arisen in numerous cases involving uh, a child who has died allegedly through uh, abuse at the hands of its parents is the delays that are occurring in in post-mortems being reported and pathology reports being received. Um, the president noted that a particular issue um, is osteoarticular um, pathology on the basis that, uh, and this is uh, to an extent truly shocking, there is in fact one professor in the UK uh, who is willing to do that uh, or at the time of the judgment uh, that is Professor Mangum he's instructed in about 100 cases a year the preparation of the osteoarticular slides on the basis that osteoarticular analysis requires actually looking at the um, the actual bones so the preparation of slides etc um, takes uh, 16 weeks in and of itself and so there are huge delays in the overall pathology reports coming back in that case, the president was being cited nine to 12 months um, and proceedings had been in train already uh, by that stage for some time. Um, and what the president indicated was it is simply not possible for the family courts to be passive, as he called it, and, ex and accept those delays uh, on the basis that children cannot wait for an outcome for that long uh, to have those uh, decisions, uh, or those post-mortem reports made available. So the court uh, said very clearly Alternative strategies is the phrase that was used um, are required and two particular ones um, or really species of the same, uh, but they've identified as two were raised. One is whether a fact find is truly required um, and whether alternate medical evidence can be used. Now, by whether a fact find is truly required, uh, what the court meant in that case was there sometimes will be evidence, and there was in this case, of abuse prior to death which had caused ultimately, allegedly, the death. The court in this case was very clear that actually, because it had the evidence of alleged prior abuse, it didn't necessarily need to determine the cause of death if it could determine whether the abuse had happened and the injuries had been caused, and that would be sufficient uh, in real terms in order to then decide whether actually uh, care orders should be made, placement orders should be made and the like in relation to remaining children. Um, and so in effect, the court could cut out uh, the post-mortem analysis. Forgive me, I've seen a message pop up uh, that there is a problem with the sound. I don't know if I can be heard okay. Um, if I could just pause a second, uh, the, the moderator, our chamber's marketing manager will hopefully respond. Somebody else is saying they can hear, so hopefully, that's Bob, we can hear issue. you. We're, we're all good this end. We can hear you. OK, thank you. And I can see numerous other people who can hear me. I apologise to, I think it was Laura Williams who was struggling. Hopefully the issue will resolve itself. Um, the position is, um, as I say, that there is, you can look actually, in fact, whether the death itself needs to be investigated. Um, and as I say, um, then actually, is there alternate medical evidence rather than pathology that can be used? Um, and in limiting the investigation in that way and using what is available, um, the hope is that now, um, in fact, it will be possible to avoid post-mortem delays. Um, 
I would intend then to move on to the next slide, uh, if I may, which is placement orders. Um, and there are two uh, cases in relation to placement orders and the making of placement orders that I'd wish to draw to your attention. Um, the first is CV, um, which is to do with the exploration of all realistic options prior to the making of placement orders, uh, which of course is a long-standing topic again, subject to many, many court of appeal judgments now. Um, in this case, what happened in essence was C was a child who had been in specialist foster care for um, a very long time um, and was receiving good care. Everybody, in fact, was content uh, with the care that C was receiving in that placement. Everybody felt that was a good placement. However, there were significant issues around the long term financial package that could be put in place uh, for those carers so as to allow C to remain within that placement. Um, and that led, in essence, to the local authority saying, um, well, the foster carers firstly saying they couldn't guarantee that they would continue to be long term foster carers, and the local authority saying, therefore, that they could not uh, support long term foster care and instead proposing a placement plan. Um, the recorder, it was a recorder in that case, um, therefore approached the matter uh, on the basis ultimately that, that foster care was not a realistic option. Um, and on appeal, the issue was put forward that actually there wasn't proper explanation of that. The recorder had said in her judgment that if she had a magic wand, she would have been ensuring uh, that there could in fact be long-term foster care. Um, and the position of the Court of Appeal was that it didn't take a magic wand, it required further and better exploration, in essence, uh, of that as a realistic option. And because it hadn't occurred, the placement order uh, needed to be revisited. And so that was CV. Um, and then we have London Borough of Newham and Mother and Father and V, a, a relatively new case, it's only about a month or two old, um, which is only tangentially to do with placement orders, um, and I'll come on to it for a different reason in a moment, but it's right, that case did make very clear that if placement orders are made, the court would expect uh, to make an order that the local authority will pay for a transcript uh, on the basis that when they later come, as often there does, applications for permission to oppose an adoption order, the court has to look back at the reasons uh, uh, which were pertaining at the time the placement order was made. Um, so I put that out there. Moving on uh, then to cases in relation to adoption. Um, an interesting case uh, for many reasons is REP, uh, a child final hear a fair hearing. It's a, an unusual set of circumstances. The position is the judge in that case was met mid proceedings uh, with an application to admit an email that the mother's solicitors had sent to the local authority solicitors at one point. Um, and uh, that hadn't been in any of the 2000 odd pages that had been available prior to the hearing starting. This was a final hearing. Uh, mother, uh, the, the email was admitted but that then led ultimately to counsel for mother uh, towards the end of mother's evidence within the final hearing, having to withdraw because they were professionally embarrassed. The judge therefore had to decide whether the hearing could proceed or not. Um, the judge ultimately did decide to proceed and indeed went on uh, to uh, make the uh, care and placement orders as sought by the local authority. But the argument on appeal was that was contrary to the mother's Article 6 rights that the hearing had proceeded in that way. Um, ultimately, the Court of Appeal did query the extent to which that email should have been admitted. Um, and although they didn't uh, decide it, in inverted commas, because it didn't need deciding, I think it's fair to say from the tone of the appeal court judgment, they wouldn't have admitted the email. That said, what they went on to say was it didn't undo the overall fairness of the hearing on the basis that mother and father were running the same case. Um, father, mother had largely concluded giving her evidence. She was towards the end of her evidence. Um, father's counsel would in due course be cross-examining the guardian on the same points. And actually looking at the circumstances of the case and the long-standing difficulties of the mother, it was not sufficient to undo the need for a placement order. So even where you had an untimely withdrawal at a very late stage, mid-trial of mother's counsel, that did not undo the propriety in that case uh, of a placement order being made. Um, 
a case which is probably going to go down in the in the bylines of history now in fact is somerset county council and nhs somerset clinical commissioning group this of course was the adoption medicals issue if i put it in that way whereby a number uh, of local authorities it wasn't initially realized it was a number but it proved to be a a significant number of local authorities up and down the country had not in fact been following uh, the correct guidance in relation to adoption medicals and the question was the extent to which that therefore was going to lead to the undoing of placement and or adoption orders that had been made. Um, however, in short, looking at that case, the position is that it won't undo uh, the making of placement and adoption orders. If the issue arises, please look at that case. Uh, but there was a concern it may open the floodgates. However, in essence, it hasn't. Um, we then move on to London Borough of Newham and mother and father. Um, and this was an application for permission to oppose adoption. Um, and the key point arising from this case um, really was there was an argument, and it was put forward in this case, that in fact, in order for a change of circumstance, in order for adoption to be opposed, there obviously has to be a change of circumstances on the parent on the part of the parent. Um, and the question is whether that change of circumstances had to be unforeseen or unexpected. And the court uh, because that had been suggested, uh, the Court of Appeal felt in some dicta in other cases. The uh, court, in essence, put a close to that argument. Uh, the court was very clear the, the change didn't have to be unexpected. It is entirely plausible, and the example they used was that a court may foresee a parent could, for example, get clean of drugs uh, or stop having substance misuse issues although the court may find it probable that the parent won't. Therefore, it wouldn't be unforeseeable that the parent would get uh, their difficulties resolved. Um, but actually, arguably, if you apply an unforeseen test, then they're ruled out. And the court felt that was completely wrong um, and unfair. The test is not whether a, leave, a change of circumstances arises which was unforeseen. Uh, the point is whether there's a change of circumstances which the court needs to take into account. Um, moving on then to uh, another recent case, uh, which you may well have heard of because it's been uh, mentioned up and down, I think, uh, the country in terms of courts, which is Cumberland Council and the mother and others. Um, this, in fact, was a, a first instance case uh, by His Honour Judge Baker, who I believe is the designated family judge for Cumbria. Now, um, the position is that um, in that case, the court was concerned, as courts often are, uh, with the late identification of alternate carers and the risk that, that may derail proceedings. In that case, uh, local guidance was set out um, and it set out equally the national case law, as it were, um, as to the need for early identification of carers, but also the fact that's not simply a duty on parents, but there is a duty on the local authority to look at alternate carers and to investigate reasonable sources of information as to alternate carers. Plainly the parents will be relevant and if they are putting persons forward that needs to be explored, but the local authority does have something of a duty to go and explore itself whether there are relevant carers. Uh, and that was laid out very clearly um, in Cumbria and I'm bound to say I've certainly heard it cited in the last 24 hours here in London. Uh, so that case has very much done the rounds. And I think we can expect to hear more of that sort of thing. Um, moving on then to my last slide um, before I hand over to Amanda, which I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear, um, is in various matters arising from fact finding hearings. Um, and there is a question. Uh, more generally, whether there is a new approach following uh, various presidents' views and the PLO relaunch and matters of that nature as to whether the court is perhaps uh, being more stringent about the need or otherwise for fact finds and the circumstances in which it will permit uh, fact finds to take place. Um, I think we'll need to watch this space on that front um, in a similar way, perhaps, to for those of you who do private law, uh, to the way in which the court is arguably being more stringent as to where the fact finds are required in private law. Um, I think a similar approach is holding sway in public law proceedings, uh, arguably due to the lack of judicial resources uh, and uh, the, the strong number of cases that are still coming through. Um, in terms of specific cases, um, a case which is does need to be looked at, to be frank, uh, when you are dealing with telephone disclosure is REHW, uh, Care Proceedings Further Fact Find. That case goes into um, quite some detail 
debate as to the way in which uh, telephone disclosure of third parties ought to be dealt with within care proceedings. In that case, it was investigation of a mobile telephone uh, of a child, and there were communications from other children, and there was an issue as to, therefore, what disclosure ought to be allowed in relation to that. There's reference to the way in which the uh, police deal with such matters and the criminal courts deal with such matters, and guidance is set out as to how the family courts ought to deal uh, with disclosure of phone uh, material arising from third parties. And I'm bound to say, in essence, the position is uh, that it should be disclosed and that there shouldn't uh, be significant redaction. But as I say, as you're dealing with a telephone disclosure case involving third parties, it is required reading um, and the procedural safeguards are set out there. Um, on the heels of what I was saying about the president's views, there are uh, the cases of Derbyshire and, and Barnsley, uh, which really relate to the court being stringent about whether a fact find is truly required or not. Uh, should there be a separate hearing, does the court really need to determine the issues? Uh, and I'm bound to say that builds on increasing, in my view, uh, judicial intervention to suggest that even if a fact find is required, does it really need to last a week when it could last three days? Uh, and of course, there's uh, more significant from that. There was a four week case, cut to a one week case by Mrs. Justice Levin, I believe. Um, and those sorts of judgments, as I say, arguably are a different approach being taken by the judiciary uh, to fact finds. Um, dealing with um, what to expect at fact finds in terms of judgments, um, RIA children pool of perpetrators is an interesting case. It's reinforced, if you wish. Uh, the idea that it is not sufficient for judges simply to recite the law um, and then go on to deal with the case. It should be interwoven. There should be genuine interaction and engagement between the law and the facts of the case. Uh, and if that doesn't occur, that is likely to be a problem and potentially appealable. Um, there's an interesting recent case, uh, WA, in relation to foreign convictions. Um, it was, uh, I would suggest, an ingenious argument. Um, it comes from civil law, and those of you who know me will know I am no civil lawyer um, in the classic sense, but in civil law, uh, the argument ran that civil convictions in, or criminal convictions of foreign countries are not necessarily decisive. Somebody tried to run that argument uh, within family proceedings, um, as I say, arguably ingeniously. Um, the court had none of it. Um, the court was very clear that, in essence, it will uh, look as generally persuasive and likely to be determinative uh, a foreign conviction. Um, however, it will look at it, but it's not intended to rerun uh, the, that finding within the proceedings. So if you have a foreign conviction, have a read. Um, in essence, it says what you'd expect, which is the court will take account of foreign convictions. Um, but interesting that somebody ran that argument. Um, and then we have uh, fairness, and uh, it says J for judge, going beyond findings sought by the local authority, which again continues a line of cases really, uh, in which we have had um, judges uh, going beyond the schedule that was presented to them. In this particular case, the judge uh, was faced with a problem. Uh, the way the judge at first instance put it was there was a lack of specificity uh, to the schedule that they had been provided. Uh, the judge then filled in, if you will, the gaps. Um, and in essence, what the court uh, highlighted was, again, the need for caution when doing that and for fair procedural safeguards to be put in place. The judge shouldn't be making findings uh, unless there's been proper notice and opportunity to comment, uh, which again is, is fairly well established, but it's a recent restatement of the law in that regard. Um, and that wraps up from me. I'll now hand over to Amanda, who's going to continue on. Thank you, Mark. Um, and just following on from what you were saying, the Derbyshire case um, I've had run recently in the last couple of weeks, and I think it's very much going to be fact specific and judge specific. Because in that case, the case that I was involved in, the judge wanted the child to know what the factual matrix was, even though it wasn't going to determine the outcome, which is, and she was referred to this case law, but um, I think, as I say, it's very much dependent on the judge and the facts. Um, the first topic that I want to deal with is uh, deprivation of liberty safeguards, which uh, I'm sure most people are, are familiar with, so I'll just call them dolls uh, for ease of reference. Um, there was a new pro forma order produced in December 2022, and hopefully you've all got that because that's the, the template that we should all be using um, in advance of our hearings and providing them to judges. 
um, it was unfortunate that it was not sent out to anyone until after December 2022 when we were all supposed to know about it, but didn't. Um, but hopefully we will know about it now. Um, and the top case uh, in, in terms of uh, doles, there is Manchester City Council. Um, I've heard it uh, referred recently by a judge to the Manchester case. Um, so it is um, very much uh, uppermost in judges' minds in terms of dealing with cases. Um, I think it's quite a welcome case because it's about whether the use of a child's uh, internet, their phone, um, their social media should be subject to adults at all. Um, we've all been going to court seeking restriction, approval for restrictions on physical liberties and then having to add on these restrictions, if you like, on the non-physical aspects. Um, and for me, it certainly it was a welcome decision that actually we don't need to tag on the non-physical restrictions because they don't constitute adults. Um, and that uh, on the slide there, you'll have all the detail that the court went into in terms of what is the remit of a local authority when exercising their parental responsibility under section 33.3b of the Children Act. Um, and in this case, um, if it wasn't physical, uh, restriction, then it's, it shouldn't be on the dolls. And I think a day later, I had a judge striking it all out of my pro forma order. So it, it's definitely something to be aware of. Um, the Anyone that practices in this area will be aware of the dark placements, suitable placements for these children that desperately need some therapeutic um, support. And that continues despite years of judges um, in the High Court decrying this lack of provision, and it doesn't seem like anything's about to change. Um, but these are just a couple of uh, recent judgments about this. Some of them are, are, are quite um, stark in reading about the difficulties that these children have faced um, and the difficulties in finding a suitable placement. Um, but one shouldn't assume that even if you've put in the best alternative options um, in one of these cases was a child being detained in a hospital, um, another in bespoke placements, that the court is going to approve it because it has to weigh up um, the balance of harm, if you like. Is it better for them to be uh, in this bespoke placement where generally there will be a high turnover of staff? Uh, even in a mental uh, health unit, there may be a high turnover of staff. Um, or would it be better for them to go to an, a home? If that's not an option, what's the alternate placement? And it, uh, it's, it's no envy, enviable task for local authorities who have to find these difficult uh, placements. Um, and it doesn't, um, all the court can do is do what it's doing is highlight it. Um, but unfortunately, it's not resolving the situation. Um, and it defines, so certainly in the Blackpool Cat Borough Council case, um, this was a subject uh, child who it was, the, it was looking at um, whether she met the very high requirement of a tier four can service. There was a very long history of serious offending, absconding, self-harming. Um, and in that case, um, even though and it, it, it was a horrible history to read about, um, she required some therapeutic care. It was, did she require it because of, because the behavior came as a result of her emotional issues as opposed to mental health issues. Um, and if there weren't mental health issues, it was kind of, the NHS were effectively pushing it back into social care. And it looks at that tension between NHS provision and social care provision. Um, and in that case, in the Blackpool case, the placement was authorized. Um, looking at the next case, which is, uh, I think on the next slide, um, is NHS Trust and ST refusal of deprivation of liberty order. And that was a case, of, I'm not sure our slides have kept up, my apologies. Uh, it's um, NHS Trust v ST, there we go. Um, that was the case that I was referring to, where it was just her current situation was described as brutal and abusive, and she had been comprehensively failed by Manchester uh, County Council. Uh, again, she had very complex needs, six to one support at school, um, and her father delivered her to hospital because he couldn't cope uh, with her any longer in the home. 
the family, the other children of the family, they're all locking themselves in their bedrooms uh, at night time and locking her in the family dining room. And it was not Manchester, but the hospital that applied for adults. And I think the, the subtext of the judgment was that uh, neither the local authority nor the hospital had applied for adults for a month after her being in the hospital placement and subject to four to one uh, restraint. Uh, which was clearly, it, she clearly met, it met the Stork test, uh, it clearly met the Dole's test, um, and yet there was a huge delay in applying for um, that. And I think the, the, the other subtext was that um, why didn't the local authority apply for it? Why had the hospital had to apply for it? Um, and in that case, the court made uh, an interim care order that refused the Dole's um, and certain parties away to try and find a better way forward. Um, there was no subscript to that as to what the final outcome was. Um, in terms of the next slide is in relation to section 20, um, which um, I don't know whether you remember, I certainly remember uh, five or six years ago, uh, a raft of cases where um, a child was subject to section 20 for longer than three months and we were being uh, Brought before the court and asked to explain those cases where why hadn't we issued, why hadn't, why hadn't the local authority issued, um, and why was it still under section 20. So I, I rather um, welcome on behalf of local authorities that the case of re S a child and re W a child, um, which looks at section 20. Uh, it's a decision of the Court of Appeal, it's Lady Justice King giving the lead judgment. Um, this was um, a, a nine and a 15 year old who were in care um, and the court was quite clear there is no statute there is nothing in statute to say that there is a limit on how long section 20 uh, can be effective for there, there's nothing to say that children have to be in it for um, uh, that they can't be in it for more than three months or for more than six months and in this case these were quite well, certainly the younger child was nine, but the court wasn't saying that there should be a care order. There was the tension between the least interventionist order uh, or whether there needed to be an order, the no order principle. Um, and in that case, the court declined to make um, uh, care orders. Uh, the children remained under Section 20. I think it would be different if you didn't have a case where parents were working obviously with the local authority which would be a key component of section 20 but the underlying principle is quite a useful principle um, because I think local authorities have become quite fearful of the use of section 20 for more than a short period of time um, and I hope that this will start a change away from rushing into court which of course we know the president doesn't want us to do he wants us to look at the thin red line cases and not uh, issue proceedings on in an overwhelmed court system. So this may be part of that, um, but perhaps that's me being cynical. Um, the uh, overleave, um, it's just a reminder that any person with parental responsibility can move a child, remove a child um, and who to notify. And it just sets out um, all the factors that were considered um, by the court. Um, there is just a reminder there, the public law working group's best practice guidance on section 20 um, is that it's got to be agreed at the outset and regular reviews. Um, what I would just say as a subscript is, of course, um, having had this recently, it must be in a language, the section 20 agreement must be in a language that the parents speak or must be interpreted to them and signed by the interpreter, not just signed by the parents, um, because you will come a cropper if that's not done. Um, so it rather backtracked on the decision of um, um, uh, the former president in re -N. The next slide relates to forced marriage protection orders. Um, these aren't something that are regularly reported on. There isn't a lot um, uh, in the um, uh, in, on Family Law Week or, or um, anywhere that you can find. I've done a number of these cases. This particular one, REP, um, was interesting to me because it is a decision of uh, Mrs Justice Knowles, 
Um, but it related to the, the person to be protected who didn't live in this jurisdiction, nor was she British. She was actually living in America. But um, the um, respondent was living in this country and was British. Um, he was still trying to persuade her and coerce her into coming back to this jurisdiction. Um, he had, this was someone who had, uh, the court found, um, raped her repeatedly during the course of their marriage. It was an overseas uh, marriage. Um, and the, the judge at first instance um, declined to make a forced marriage protection order because uh, they took the view that um, the person to be protected wasn't in this jurisdiction and therefore the court didn't have um, any locus to make protective orders. Um, but that was overturned on appeal. Um, the court runs through the Forced Marriage Protection Act, 2007 being the relevant act, and was very clear that the person to be protected doesn't need to be in the jurisdiction as long as one of the parties are. Um, the next slide relates to uh, adoption and notification of fathers. Checking how I'm doing this one. Um, this was a decision of his honour judge Vincent, who was sitting as a high court judge, um, and it was a review of ABC um, adoption notification of fathers. Um, this was where the child had already been placed with prospective adopters, and it was an application under Part 19 of the Family Procedure Rules. Um, it was a case um, where the mother had uh, chosen to relinquish her child um, and the social workers had told the mother it was her right to withhold information about the father. Um, you see I've put wrong there in capital letters uh, with an exclamation mark. Um, it's not right um, because the court and the local authority has a duty of notification um, and the, in that case because the child had already been placed the prospective adopters were joined as interveners and the court determined that the father should be notified and the local authority were required to undertake extensive searches in order to identify him um, and you'll see from the postscript there what they'd done um, using an inquiry agent a genealogical research company I didn't quite get to, grab to the bottom of exactly what that involved um, but various other forms um, and they still couldn't identify him and at that point the court said enough is enough you've done you know, you've made reasonable um, efforts to identify him and of course delay being inimical to the welfare of the child um, there was no requirement for the local authority to notify him um, so it's I, I found that interesting for the steps that that the local authority were required to, to do uh, to go to to notify a father and that seems to be a, a starting point and very much a, um, a theme throughout the reported cases that there is a requirement if at all possible to notify fathers although um, I've recently concluded a, a case which I believe is due to be published at some point where um, the mother raised an allegations of honour-based violence in relation to um, a child that she had had um, out of um, a relationship and uh, there were issues about her mental health um, and there were difficulties with identifying another of the children that she was seeking to relinquish. Um, and the court determined that uh, looking at, I think, again, they're very fact specific, but looking at it in the round, the risks were too high to the mother to even start the process of um, investigating who the fathers were. One would have been impossible if it was a one night stand um, the other was a close family member with the risk of unabased violence underlining that um, would have posed a real risk to her, but also the real risk to her mental health. Um, and in those circumstances, as I say, the court determined that uh, the father should not be notified. Um, I think uh, Mark has already touched on um, re, uh, P, uh, RIA, the fair hearing, where the mother's advocates withdrew at short notice. Um, looking over leaf, uh, the re-M was a child leave to oppose adoption. Um, the Court of Appeal granted, in that case, the local authorities appeal against permission um, for the mother to oppose an adoption order. Um, the marks touched on this again, but they ran through the test 
Um, it was, I thought, noteworthy because um, this is a, a constant tension at, at the end of a, a trial as to who's responsible for getting a transcript or should there be one, um, because obviously there are cost implications and administrative implications. Uh, but the Court of Appeal were quite clear there that it is the duty of the local authority. Um, so in, in essence, uh, that will save us all some time, I hope, because we won't be having those debates uh, going forward. Um, but also it's useful, of course, for the child's um, file, that that judgment will sit on their ch children's file and can be looked at them when they come of age. Um, that is, of course, the only time that the local authority won't have to obtain a um, transcript of the judgment is if there is a written judgment and agreed note. The court did say in that case that it was any cases involving the making of a placement order or a care order. Um, we may still have some arguments about whether we really need a transcript for a care order, but I can certainly see the, 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 reason, the reasoning for a placement order. Um, so that concludes uh, the a quick romp through my slides. Um, in terms of um, after today, I'm told that the um, questions will be followed up by email to thank you all for attending uh, and being patient with us. Um, the recording will be available for tomorrow. Uh, the next webinar in our series will be our junior family webinar series, which will take place on Thursday, the 18th of May, with Hannah Cox and Catherine Howells, who will uh, be discussing how to prepare for success at FDRs. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.